Good morning, Journey. My name is Tammy Joseph, and I'm the Next Gen Pastor here. And I just want to take a moment and welcome everyone that's joining us online and those at our Lake County campus. We're in a series called Relationship Goals, and today looks a little bit different, and I'm super excited about it. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing Pastor Dustin and TJ, so we're going to be hearing from them, not only Pastor Dustin today, but also his wife, TJ, and I've known them mm. for over over 15 years. I have, to, I have a tough job today. I got to keep them in line. <laughs> I've known, I think they're clapping for you, TJ. Yeah, they, oh. they're clapping for you, boo. Um, but I've had the privilege of knowing them for over 15 years, and I've seen their marriage in public settings, but also in their home. And as we've been talking about having marriages that are Christ centered, devil kick- kicking, and covenant keeping, There's nobody that embodies this more than they do. And so as we dive in, I'm excited for y'all to hear from them. So TJ, we're going to start with you. So help us understand where did it all start for you guys? Okay, and I will. But first, if you don't mind, I'm going to just go ahead and say, I usually sit in a different seat in the auditorium. It's right over there. And so this is quite an honor. And I'm grateful to be sitting here and seeing all you guys this morning. Journey means so much to our family and we've been so blessed by Journey and just to be a part of such a wonderful church family like you guys. And we pray for y'all all all the time and we're just really grateful um, to be here. So thank you very much. Yeah, good. And now I will tell you where it all started. So (laughs) uh, Dustin and I grew up in the same church youth group, uh, student ministry. It, from middle school on. Oh, so here we are. And this is before we were dating. Who would have thought from that view, y'all would have ended up where you are now? Uh, I was asking him, I remember I was like, hey, do you know any beautiful girls? And then he was like, I got you. <laughs> so this is us, yes. And this is also Dustin was rocking those sideburns. So <laughs> he was not scared. Um, but yeah, so we, we started just hanging out as friends. We were not dating. We ran in the same friend group, same circle of people that were pretty like-minded as us. And so we were friends until my senior year in high school, his freshman year in college, when we accidentally went on a date and it's all history <laughs> from there. Okay, wait, I yeah. hear some laughing. What does accidentally go on a date mean? Okay, so... Means there is a God, <laughs> like, yes. Let me explain. <laughs> So uh, we had our group of friends and like the guys were all getting together to meet up and the girls were all going to try to hang out together. And this is before cell phones, like before we were all super communicative in our technology. And so it ended up just being the two of us. There were some other plans that were bouncing around and we went to dinner out by um, Disney Springs, hung out and just really enjoyed our time together. And things kind of started there. Yep. Yep. So Dustin, what was it that attracted you to TJ? Well, did anything, anything that happened on our first date that I had to later bring up to a counselor? I mean, <laughs> is there anything? Because there's something that stands out to me. And I've shared this to them before, but I think it would be good. A lot of people don't believe me. On our, on our first date, she tells me she does karate. And I didn't say it like that. And she's like, you know, and at this time, I, I'm a college athlete. I played baseball in college. So I'm like, listen, little girl, it doesn't matter how much karate you know. You cannot take me. And I was just, without knowing it, just being sexist. I was like, you can't take me. End of story. So after dinner, we're in the parking lot. And I'm like, give me your best shot. And when you tell a girl that, especially back then, it was kind of like, ha, 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 in the shoulder. That's not what she did. She gets in her little karate pose and gives me like a 10 count to the gut, knocks the wind out of me. I fall to the ground and I look up and I'm like, I love you. Is that a true story? Yeah, he's not wrong. And he hasn't ever said anything like that since. So (laughs) I think we cleared the air there. It is fair to say, yes. So, uh, yeah, literally. So the question is, what attracted me yeah, to besides TJ? Besides her knocking you out, yeah. what else were you like, attracted to I was TJ? like, listen, we got to be friends because I don't want to keep getting hurt. So <laughs> when I met TJ, uh, I fell in love with an angel. And I mean that in a lot of different ways. Um, we have a photo. There she is. 
Yeah. She was an angel in the church play. And, um, and so uh, we, we just grew up the same uh, church and student ministry. And I just, we always knew of each other. We always hung out. And I was just always impressed. You know, when you're friends with somebody, uh, you don't really get impressed with friends. But she always impressed me. She loved God and loved the church more than anybody else I knew. And she was the most beautiful girl inside and out. And one of the things I was really attracted to her is she was a very strong, independent woman, a woman of God. Like she didn't need anything else. And that was refreshing to see somebody that was so rooted in Christ that if she had things, that was nice, but she didn't need other people or need anything. And I remember one time we were on a, on a retreat uh, and this was really early on. I don't even know if we were dating and, and I remember at this church retreat, it was very loose in the morning and so people could sleep in, but I noticed what she was doing every morning. She was waking up before everybody else and sneaking away by herself with a Bible and she would study the Bible and, and pray. And I remember I got this photo of her early on. And this is who TJ is. When nobody's around, when nobody's looking, her love for Jesus shines. And, and so I just fell in love with that from the beginning. I love that. Yep. So I feel sort of um, <laughs> bad saying this about my pastor, but um, TJ, what were you attracted to in <laughs> Dustin based on this? <laughs> I mean, what's not to love? I mean, I'm the total package. Braces and fro, what's up? I mean, man, wow. That's, we can take that down, okay. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm it, curious about this question. It, it, it was an impressive hair situation. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But I think what attracted me to Dustin was the fact that you took your relationship with the Lord very seriously from the get-go. Like there was no question about where you stood with God and how you were trying to honor the Lord with your life. And your calling into ministry was so solid and such a, just, you were listening to the, the call of the Lord on your life. And I just felt like that was such a wonderful quality in a significant other who has that deep relationship with the Lord, who takes God very seriously. I need to keep this here. Who keeps God very serious in his life, but doesn't take life seriously. And as you can tell, Dustin's a fun guy. We enjoy spending time together, having fun and laughing. And that was also valuable to me that you don't take life seriously, but you definitely take your relationship with the Lord seriously. That's good. So people that are listening today, we have people at all different seasons of life. We have students, we have um, adults that are dating, we have um, different seasons in people's marriages, we have divorce, we have widow. And so we talk, you just shared a little bit about how um, you guys started dating, but what piece of, pieces of advice would you speak into people today that are specifically in the dating process? Yeah, I would say I wanna speak to two different camps. And so I wanna speak to, the camp of those that are not inside my family, and then I wanna to speak to my daughter, who is also here. If you're my daughter, don't date, don't ever date, don't, you know, just calm down. And to everybody else, this is what I would tell you for dating, um, I would say go slow. Uh, I see so many couples go way too fast in, in any area uh, of things, whether it's physically, whether it's verbally, whether it's emotionally, and they just, they become so quickly infatuated with each other that they isolate from anything and everybody else, which is so unhealthy, but you don't know that it's unhealthy. Everybody else, else around you knows how unhealthy it is except you. And so I think what you do in the first 90 days is the most important thing you can do in a relationship because what you're doing, whether you know it or not, is you are creating the foundation on which the entire relationship is built on. So if you don't pray or talk about God or go to church together the first 90 days, it is so much harder to add that later. But if your foundation is we're gonna pray together, we're gonna talk about God, we're gonna do stuff together, then that becomes your foundation. If your foundation is we're gonna isolate and never hang out with anybody else other than ourselves, well, your foundation now is isolation and not healthy community. And so I would say be very intentional and go slow your first 90 days and make sure that it's built on what you want it to be built on. And Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter six. He says, a foundation that's built on him will last no matter what, 
but a foundation not built on him, even the small storm will knock it out. And so my encouragement is do everything you can your first 90 days to protect that. And then one of the things I would even, oh, then here we got a picture. This is TJ and I dating, wearing a thrashing for Jesus shirt. So my family owns a, a Christian bookstore. So I had every cheesy Christian shirt you can imagine. Um, and so this is a, a picture of us when we were dating and we did a lot of group things together. We did it. And I'm not saying you always have to do that, but it's one thing for me to see what TJ's like when we're one-on-one. -on -one. But when I see what she's like around other people, around authority, around people she doesn't like, I learn a lot about her. And so I would encourage when you're, you're starting to date and do things in community as well or multiple, uh, you know, double dating and things like that. But one of the things that I, if I, if I could share this, that I'm, I'm passionate about as a youth pastor for so many years, I saw so many tens settle for twos. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking like incredible people, but their insecurity made them date this, like, this person that they should never date. And once they start dating, they were so infatuated with how that person made them feel that nobody can speak any truth to that person. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We all have seen that. And so this is what I would encourage you to do. Before you start dating anybody, go to a trusted friend and say, hey, I am giving you a green light to speak into my life. If you see anything in my dating relationship, anything in my life, I'm giving you permission to call me out on that. And that's not just if you're dating. If you're married, you should have that. And so one of the things that uh, I didn't realize until literally last service, I kind of just had a light bulb moment. I've never known TJ ever without her being discipled by somebody else. I've never known her without somebody else pouring into her. And she's never known me without having a mentor pouring into me. So the beginning of our relationship, we already had people telling us, hey, you're off track here, or hey, be careful how you talk, or hey. So when it came to a, a dating, it was natural for them to speak into that. And now that we're married, we have people that say that, that can call us out. How do we treat each other? Are we going on date nights? How are we spending money? What do we, like anything and everything we have given a couple people, not everybody, a couple key people, a, a green light to speak into our, into our marriage. And I think it's been great. That's great. TJ, you have anything else you wanna add related to that? Well, I would just say in the, along the same line, in the same vein, is that you wanna give people that green light to speak into your life, into your marriage, into your dating life that have the same values and that love you and trust, you know, you trust them and that it's a, it's the right type of relationship for that to happen. But you don't always, it's not always like a negative thing people are speaking. Sometimes that someone might say, hey, I really see that this person brings out the best in you. Yep. Or saying things that are also positive. We always assume that it's just gonna be negative. Right. And I don't think that's always the case. Yeah. The I mean, one of the things we do is we accidentally bring past pain into current relationships and, and a trusted friend can say, hey, listen, that person's not like you're describing. You're bringing past scars into that. That's actually a good person. You've been engaged for 24 years. You should probably get married. Like, go for it, okay? <laughs> Quit dragging your feet. And there's a, a verse in the Bible. There's a, a book of the Bible called Song of Songs that's all about uh, romance and relationships. And, and it says three times, do not awaken love until the time is right. Do not awaken love until the time is right. Do not awaken love until the time is right. And what it's saying is, it's like, hey, there will be a time for that, but go slow, enjoy whatever stage you're at. It doesn't have to be defined on the second date. You don't need to talk about marriage on the second date. You don't have to go enjoy that season. And just inviting people in is really what Proverbs says, is iron sharpens iron. And that's the whole idea of giving somebody a green light into your life. Yeah, that's good. I think a key part, just listening to you guys, is permission. Yeah. Because when you give somebody permission, that completely changes everything. Yes. So often in friendships, we can have something that we really need to say to somebody, but it can be received completely different when that permission piece is and, missing. And, and, and Tammy, I think that's a generational thing. Mm -hmm. I think previous generations felt like they could speak into somebody's life. But now it's like nobody wants to speak in anybody's life because everybody's offended by everything. So you have to give somebody the permission and the green light to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. So as we dive a little bit deeper into marriage, um, what are some key ingredients y'all have for maintaining a strong and a healthy marriage? Yeah, I would say being intentional. I think being, I don't know off the top of my head, a marriage that struggled that has intentionally cared for. And this is what Galatians 6, 7 through 9 says. It says, a man reaps what he sows. 
Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And a couple weeks ago, we had a lot of people stand that have been married 30, 40, 50 years. And what they were doing is they were living out this verse. They, they did not get tired of doing good and they were reaping the benefits of that. And so I wanna say to those people, thank you. Thank you for you investing. And if that wasn't, you know, we weren't able to stand up that long. And so that gives us hope to keep investing, keep doing good to one another so that we could have the fruit that they have. So that would be one of the things I would share. Yeah, you guys do, you guys celebrate each other's strengths so well, and then you also embrace each other's differences. TJ, what thoughts do you have related to that, how you guys do that? Well, I think that we have had to really communicate and over-communicate in order to do that. I think for us, communication, which I know that's a very common theme to say, that's for marriages or relationships, but communicating in a way that is beneficial, constructive, kind, not out of frustration, and at the right time. Um, I am the queen of to-do lists and I just wanna get things done. And if you're running out the door to go somewhere, it's not the best time to necessarily bring things in, but um, communicating those things so that we can encourage one another in those areas, like you're mentioning, of differences or uh, yeah. just being I, there for one I another. I remember how, <laughs> you were so kind early on, but I remember- I love when you start talking with a laugh. Well, <laughs> I remember she was so kind when we first got married, but she was, I could just see, she was so disappointed. Like, I, I had, three brothers, I was one of four boys. I didn't know what a girl was until we got married. And she thought I had all this knowledge about women. And I, so I told her early on, assume nothing and most of the time you'll be right. Okay, like assume I don't know anything. And she kind of thought that was a joke. And then I, I like literally assume I don't know anything. And then that's when more and more she started going, oh, he really doesn't know anything about women. And so, then the lines of communication, that's when you were like, okay, it helps if I just really am clear on certain things. And that was helpful. Yeah, it was helpful. And it was also helpful for me to, to make assumptions that you know what I'm thinking or how I'm feeling. I have to be, I have to take responsibility for that and communicate yeah. that the right way to I you. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, that's good. Excellent. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> I'm God just, has. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> God has designed each one of us very different, and so when we come into this marriage and of two people becoming one, um, how do you see your God-given roles in your marriage, knowing that you both are very different? Yeah. The, the cool part about this question is God gives us clear directions in Scripture, and I I, I love that He does that. But I think this verse that I'm about to read is one of the most misused and abused verses in America, specifically with men. And it's Ephesians 5, and it spells out the roles of husband and wives. And it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. Husbands. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And if you were to ask so many men in the church, what is their relationship? So many of us immediately know wives are supposed to submit to the men. And I just want to just kind of preach for a minute. Men, listen, we, we hear that, we know that, but there's a couple things wrong with that. One, the very first sentence, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, which means it's not just her job to submit to me, we're supposed to submit to each other. Even if she doesn't do it because it says out of rever or even if she doesn't deserve it because it says out of reverence for Christ. Then it doubles down on her and what us men like to do is we like to identify what the wife should be doing and a lot of us are clueless what we should be doing because we can say you're supposed to submit to me and then the question is, well, what is the role of the husband? Uh, I don't know. Well, it says it right here. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ died for the church. Do you understand? Like that is a massive commitment that we are making to our spouses that I am laying everything I desire aside to you. Every hobby, everything I enjoy, everything is secondary to you. Pastor, are you saying we can't have hobbies? No, no, no. 
have hobbies, but I can't tell you how many marriages I see men coming into and they're like, hey, this is what I do every Friday night. This is what I do. This is how I am. You just need to accept that. And what they're saying is, I am a higher priority than you. You need to submit. And that's not at all the spirit of Christ. What this is and what the spirit is, is you die to self, make her the top priority, and then everything else falls into place. Jesus talks about this in Philippians 2. He says he didn't cling to his authority or divinity. Instead, he gave it up to serve others. And so in this passage, this isn't a a slave master relationship where I just make commands and she does it without any questions. That's not at all what it is. According to this scripture, what this is saying is that I am the lead servant in our home. That's what it means. I have to lead better and stronger than anybody else in our home. And when I do that, it's gonna make it a lot easier for her to submit. submit. But she doesn't wait until I master that to submit. She submits no matter what. And likewise, she's not waiting until I have it all together to submit. And that's the beauty of marriage. As she's submitting and as I'm serving, it is a complete trust and then intimacy. And that's the picture painted in Ephesians 5. And I love it. Yeah, that's really good. Thanks for unpacking that. Um, I, truly, as good friends of y'all's, like, I see that so much in y'all's marriage. Um, so we live in a very distracting world. Can I, can I just, I'm, I'm, I'm fired up. Yes. Can I just keep going, Tammy? Yes, please go. I, I got to brag on TJ. TJ's really, really good at this. Like she, from day one, was so good at being submissive. And what I found out that we can accidentally do, men, is if your wife is good at this, you can accidentally or purposefully take advantage of it. And I did that early on without knowing it. I didn't mean to. And so I'll give you an example. We'd go out to dinner. I said, where do you want to go? And this is a very vanilla example, but you, you'll get the point. I say, where do you want to go? Well, her effort to be submissive and serve me, she would say, wherever you want. And I would ask her again, and then she would say the same thing. And then so I just got in the habit of going, okay, we'll go wherever I want. And totally neglecting that she also is a foodie and, have a, and has opinions. And so that I had to learn to pry them out and pull them open and then likewise, you can speak into this, you learn to find your voice as well. Uh, yeah, I think that it's important, it was important for me to voice my opinions, again, in a constructive, kind, loving way, and not only just become something that God didn't create me to be. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's really Sorry, good. Sorry, Tam. No, it's all good. Um, so we live in a distracting world and so many things can pull for our tech attention. And so how do you navigate the noise of the world specifically with social media and technology? Yeah, this is a good question because um, TJ and I are on polar opposites when it comes to technology and social media. And so I'll let you share in a minute. But for me, I think that the thing I love about TJ is that her, she's rooted in Christ. And because of that, she doesn't go to social media and, and she doesn't need likes. She doesn't need certain followers. And if you're not rooted in Christ, you will look for likes and followers from anything or anybody, whether it's on social media or not. And so I think it all begins at being rooted in Christ. And when you are there, then you can potentially kind of have some healthy rhythm. So I, I kind of lean into the camp of enjoying social media. I'll let you share a little bit of your heart. So I sit on a different side of the fence with social media, and that's just my own personal preference. I see there's value in it for some people, and there's value in it for maybe professions or lifestyles. It's just not something that I personally spend a lot of my time um, investing in. It's not something that I, I want to spend too much time in my mind. I don't like that much real estate being taken up by those things personally. It's my own personal conviction. And it's just something that doesn't help me emotionally, spiritually, uh, mentally. So it's just something I don't really invest a lot of time on. Yeah, and I think what's important here that I would note for, for relationships, but people in general, is, is to make the distinction what's a command in the Bible and what's a conviction. This is her personal conviction. And the problem is if she takes her conviction and tries to make it my command, it's not my command and it's not my conviction. So this is between her and God, what she feels convicted on. She needs to obey that. But unless God speaks to me like that, I don't need to obey that. So we can enjoy each other's unique um, giftings, wirings, and even convictions without having to convince the other person that they're right or wrong. 
Some of you, you might even be offended with her right now because you tried to friend her on Facebook. I'm just gonna tell you, she don't even know how to ex- accept a friend. It's true, she I tried no the idea. other day. I tried the other day and it, there, I couldn't do it. Yeah, she has There's, no idea. I don't know where the button is. I don't, it's not my thing. And, I, and I'm fine if it's other people's thing. I just, if I've offended you, I really do apologize. But, I don't know how to work it. But for me, I love social media. As a matter of fact, you can follow me on social media <laughs> at Dustin Agar, <laughs> at Danish underscore pastor. I love it. So you won't find TJ there, but you will find me. And, and here's the thing, I, I really do. You, well, I'd love to connect with you on social media. Now listen, the problem with social media, I gotta put this out there. That don't mean you can hit me up 24 seven. So like, you know, I can't solve everything. I can't reply to everything, comment on everything, but I love interacting with you. I love seeing what's going on in your world. And, and when I'm doing that every now and then, I'll be able to, it gives me a, a prayer prompt as well. So I like it, but there, you just see two different sides. One's not right, one's not wrong. So yeah. Yeah, we can laugh about that, but I just really love in y'all's marriages how you can have two completely different viewpoints on the same exact topic, but there's still such honor and respect in y'all's marriage in that. So um, as we move along, how do you set healthy boundaries in your relationship? And maybe if you could just share what some of those are with us. Yeah, I think boundaries, to kind of give a definition to it are, I think what boundaries do is they, they draw a line to create um, space to say, I feel safe on this side and I feel uncomfortable on that side. And and really, so I think what's important is to have a conversation and ask your, your spouse, where is it that you feel safe and where is it that you don't feel safe? Mentally, emotionally, verbally, physically, in every area, and, and sometimes they could be weird, but they're very healthy conversations. Where do you feel safe? Where do you feel unsafe? And then let's draw some, some boundaries. And here's the thing, boundaries, I, I'm not saying, we're gonna share a couple of ours. This is not for everybody. These are our convictions, what we want for our personal boundaries. Everybody has different history and makeup. And so what I would say is, I think everybody should have some type of boundary, but I don't, I don't think there's one size fits all. And what I would say is when you create boundaries, not everybody is going to understand your boundary or agree with your boundary. So I'll give you an example. One of our boundaries from day one was we obey the the Billy Graham rule. And if you don't know what the Billy Graham rule is, is we will not be in a room or a car one-on-one with the opposite sex. So we've never done that, that's just a rule. And I remember Mike Pence, when he was vice president, somehow he said that or it came out And man, the media just blasted him. Called him sexist, it's this, all kinds of negative stuff. And here's what I would say, when we create boundaries, even some of you in a room full uh, this size in online Lake County, some of you aren't gonna like that rule that I just said or that boundary, and maybe you agree it's sexist. But here's what I would tell you. I did not make a covenant to get your approval on my boundaries. I made a covenant to my wife. And... And so I will do anything to protect that sacred covenant, anything to protect what makes her feel comfortable and safe. And that means I can't please and get everybody's approval. And that's okay because this is, this is where I need to focus that energy. That's you got good. any thoughts, Boo? Yeah, so in reference to the boundaries question, one of, one of the things when I interpret this question that I think of is my own personal my own personal relationship with Christ, Mm -hmm. I feel if I am not investing in that relationship first, if I'm not seeking the Lord and how to be a better wife and how to be a human and how to be a mom, then I'm not, I'm not creating that safe space in our marriage or even a space of growth in our marriage. If I'm not putting that relationship with my relationship with the Lord, um, first. So, and I like that. And and because when I first heard this question, I didn't think about that at all, but, but she's right. She protects her morning routine no matter what. No matter what yesterday was like, no matter what happened last night, no matter what time she goes to bed, I can count on her waking up the same time, getting in the word and praying and praying for our family, our marriage, praying for you. And, and you do protect that. And I do think that's what that triangle that we talked about a couple of weeks ago is all about. As she is growing closer to God and creating those boundaries, and I am, God meets us in the middle and galvanizes us. And, and I love that. And 
One of the other boundaries that we have, and I mentioned it a couple weeks ago too, is, is we don't say the word divorce in our home. That's just not something we throw around. And Yeah, and that's something that no matter how frustrated or angry I get, it's, it's a word we choose not to use in our house because you know we did make a vow to one another to honor one another and to grow in our marriage towards the Lord. And that's a covenant that we have made that we don't take that for granted. And we take, we hold that for truth. Yeah. And I'm not letting the devil even have a small crack in my marriage by using words that yeah. are going to take it apart. Cause he doesn't like my marriage yeah. chasing after the Lord. So that's good. Amen. I like our marriage. So we know in, um, in any relationship, we know that there will be challenges um, at different times. And so I know that some listening today may be really in a difficult season with their marriage. So what would you say to those trying to save a struggling marriage? Hmm. I would say, I think my first thing I would say is I'm just proud of you. And that might sound confusing, but if, you're, if you feel like your marriage is struggling and you knew what the topic was today, and you came, that tells me that you're still faith-filled and hopeful. And I think that says a lot about you. And I, I think what we run to in crisis says in some ways what we put our hope in. And in and, and Psalms over and over and over says, God is our refuge, God is our refuge. So for you to come here and, and try to see what God might be able to do in your marriage, I think that's awesome. And then I, I would also say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you feel like you're in a rough spot in a valley, and this is what I would encourage you, is anytime any of us are in a valley, the enemy wants us to make it seem like it's not a season, but that it's a new forever. But it is a season, and not every season is summer. Sometimes there's a fall season, sometimes there's a winter season. And when you are in a valley, a valley only exists because it's surrounded by two mountains, which means there's two mountaintops, not just the one you used to be in, but the one God's about to take you on. And so I would say, don't give up. Don't get discouraged as much as it's on you. And I know it, it takes two people, but as much as it's on you, don't lose hope. One of the things I would strongly encourage is uh, get counseling. Get counseling. I go to counseling because i rather get into counseling before there's a crisis so that I can prevent a crisis. And sometimes when, I, when people hear that, they're like, they're shocked that I go to counseling. They're like, they, they're like man, you must have like some problems. And I'm like, I do have some problems. Like I got a lot of problems. And so I want to play offense more than defense, but I would say get counseling. It's so important. One of the, the things I would, um, that I would tell you is, is a counselor would say, halt, don't make a decision when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And I would say, don't, don't start or end a relationship when you're there. So I wouldn't entertain being engaged or getting married or ending a relationship if you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I would say you should avoid all middle, like medium, and high range decision making when you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And just in my own survey, uh, sadly, just with the nature of my job, talking with so many couples throughout the years of just divorce and and. And I kind of will ask a question, not this Frank, but I'll kind of ask a question of like, well, well, tell me about the godly counsel that you got to arrive to this decision. And wouldn't you know that 100% of the time they don't name one person? That they made a decision, a life altering decision in a vacuum without any godly uh, advice. And that's what Proverbs 15, 22 says. It says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. And the moment that we said, I do, and the moment that you get married or got married, you, you have a plan. And what it's saying is it's going to fail if you don't bring counsels, uh, advice, and encouragement alongside of you. But with many advisors, they succeed. And so I would say bring trusted, godly people into some of those tough conversations. Don't do it alone. It's just too hard. Yeah, that's really good. So as we wrap things up, I know from being your friend and to, from following you on social media, that um, you guys have fun in your marriage. Um, so TJ, I wanna start with you. What do you do to keep the spark? What do you do to keep the fun in your marriage? Gosh. Okay, well, this is great because it's the third service. So this is the third time I've been able to share this. And I'm, we enjoy having fun. Dustin and I enjoy laughing together and having fun together. 
and I enjoy laughing, and most of the time he's laughing with me, but sometimes it's at his expense. But <laughs> so one of the fun things we kind of do is Dustin will sometimes fall asleep in random places in my house, and I choose to document it. So I'll shoot a, I'll take a picture, maybe a short video, uh, so things along those lines, share it with him at another time. I don't put it on social media, so that's a good reason I'm not on social that's media. Great. Right there. Thank you. Um, so, and I, we're all friends, so I'm gonna let you be a part of this with me. Um, this, this is audio of one of these experiences that Dustin most recently had. <laughs> so, so he he did you were okay with that being shared yes yes and we talked about it on the front end but we have fun and we laugh together and that is something silly between the two of us that is something and now you well yeah that's true <laughs> but it is it's just as a in your marriage you want to have those moments where it's something special between the two of you now that's maybe not special for Dustin but we do have experiences where we we do things that we enjoy doing together. We go out and we have fun and we try to have conversations about our dreams and our life outside of our schedule. So we do, we do have fun together as well. I would like to apologize to you. Some of you came to church looking for a word from the Lord and you left with my pastor snores. And I am blown away how much joy it really does give you. Like it really, it makes her so happy to record me sleeping. And I think it's sexist because here's the deal. Here's the deal. What if I got up here and was like, hey, you know what I love to do? I love to film my wife while she sleeps. Y'all would be like, what a freak. But that's what you love to do. Well, not, I mean, it's not the only thing I love to do. You asked for an example. Yeah. So I provided one that you guys might judge me, and that's fine. Oh, they're I mean, judging. I, oh, yeah. All right. So fun. I'll give the spiritual answer. Go ahead. I, I, I would say this. Make your marriage a priority. And so it, this is what I would say. If it's kind of like a, um, a fire, don't wait for the fire to go out to try to put kindling in. If there's a fire, which there is when you got married, constantly put pieces of wood in. That's what date nights are. So TJ and I, we prioritize our marriage. We prioritize date nights. Once a week, we'll go on a date night. If not, every other week, she and I will prioritize that. Even when we didn't have money, we would figure out how do we just get away just the two of us. And I would encourage you there, don't wait until your kids graduate to make your marriage a priority. I see too many people that they have kids and they say, we'll start dating. They don't say this, but they kind of, the kids become the top priority, not the marriage. And then 18 years go by, and now it's like, I don't know this person, it's a roommate, because your kids were the priority, but now they're gone. And so I would say, find ways to make your marriage a priority. This is what Matthew 6, says. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So I would say, keep Christ at the center, make your marriage a priority. One of the things we didn't know, uh, and again, these are our rhythms, you figure out your rhythms, but one of the things we didn't know early on was, it took us probably five or six years to figure this out is for us to get away for 36 hours away from chores, we had to get outside of our house, all the projects work. For us just to get a hotel on the other side of Orlando, we're in Florida, so there's nice hotels, pretty cheap. It felt like we were renewed every time we do that. So we try two to three times a year just to get away for 36 hours and that has really blessed our marriage and just given us a fun time away. So we, we enjoy doing that. That's good. I can remember when we first became friends, like we would rotate date nights. So we, we had a date night every Friday, but one week we were watching the kids, my husband and I, and then the following week they were watching the kids because we couldn't afford for babysitters, yeah. but we knew we needed to get out. And I love that um, early on in our friendship. So as we, as we close, are there any final thoughts or encouragement that you have for everyone today? I would just say... Um, your marriage is worth you fighting for. And don't stop fighting, it, it's important. And so keep, it's never, I never met a couple that has been longer, married longer than a day that said, our marriage is perfect. Like every, there's always something to fight for. And, and just keep fighting, it's worth it, I promise. Yeah, TJ, you have any final things? 
No, I agree with that. I mean, it's, it's worth the fight for sure. It's, it's worth the investment, 100%. That's great. Well, thank you so much for just being vulnerable and letting us see behind y'all's marriage. And of course, TJ, we have some beautiful flowers for you just from the church. So as we close, would y'all mind closing us in prayer? Yeah. Let's, uh, let's pray. So God, we come before you to, to thank you. God, thank you for the gift of one another and whether we're in a season of singleness or relationship or marriage, would we steward that season well? Would our hope and would our source of joy not come from a relationship but from you? And would whatever you give us on top of that be an overflow? And so God, would you help us to have Christ-centered, devil-kicking, covenant-keeping marriages? God, I pray for revival in our marriages. God, I pray for a, a sense of revival in our relationships that, that, God, where there is pain, would you help bring healing? God, where there needs to be forgiveness, would you help us to put our pride aside and forgive or to ask for forgiveness? And God, I pray for the marriage that might be struggling. Would you rescue it? That's what you love to do, to bring dead things to life. And so would you bring dead marriages back to life? Would you perform spiritual CPR right now? God, you're our hope, you're our joy, you're our everything. We love you, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.